when I started about six or seven years ago, um, there was a lot of talk amongst the land management teams that were, we were finding lots of unauthorised trails, and that was partly because we were putting more staff into the forest because we had a treaties in it. So bits of woodland that we'd never normally look at for 20 years because we're letting the trees grow, we were going in to look at and, and survey for tree disease, but then finding the spider and unauthorised trail. Grow. So all of a sudden we started finding there was lots of unauthorised trails. They'd always been there, but we just started finding them. Um, so my bosses tasked me with trying to get a handle on where we are now, what's the scale of the problem right now. And so I worked with a contractor, and we went out and did the mapping exercise that you've just been talking about. And just to try and get some data to, you know, if we're going to tackle it and, and try and work our way through it, what's the size of the problem? So within that South Wales Valley um, area, we uh, mapped 150 kilometres of trails. Um, so nearly as much an authorised trail as we have official trail. If we were going to add that to our trail maps, it cost us about £15 million. Pounds. We've got it for free if we manage to keep it there and manage it and do it properly. Um, we reckon we've got about 70% of the nail network. Not everybody tells you where it is, so we reckon we've got, we've got really good connections with the riders and the diggers, and we reckon we've got about 70% of it mapped now. Um, and I have contact with about 20 plus groups of individuals um, in the basis of trying to see how we make all this work. Um, did the same thing, plucked Strava. This is a woodland block near uh, Bristol on the border with, with England and, and Wales. Can't quite see it, but all the little lines there, the unauthorised trails in there. What we did was then we pulled off the user data to get a feel for, if there's lots of trails, which ones have been ridden the most? Which ones have got features on it? So as well as giving us that line on the map, the contractor also took features of things like where there's conflicts with public rights away, where things are being built. Um, and so what we ended up with is a load of data. Don't worry about it, you can't see it, but it doesn't really matter. But within that woodland block, there's, uh, there's 14,000 metres of trail. There was 4,296 people using it, and, and 120 individual users. You can pull that off Strava. So you can get a feel for how often stuff's been used very quickly. Local tracks for local people. Kind of tongue in cheek, but that's the reality. You, you, you're dealing with local people and, and your community that you're trying to work with. And they want to ride something. And Mike, like Mike said, that, you know, the, the authorised trail network fits a vast majority of the market. People getting into mountain biking. But then there's always a desire for more challenge. And through my coaching background, if you're, if you're interested, Google flow, um, flow State, scientifically proven now about why people want to get that challenge. Releases chemicals in the brain, you feel happy, you're excited about it. And then we, within the outdoors, people have always talked about flow as this kind of magical thing. You do that ski run, you go for that run, you do that kayaking session down the river, and you feel amazing about it. And it's a release of those chemicals that drives people for this challenge. And so that's what you've got to understand is they're not out there wantonly to destroy your land or your operations. They're doing it to make them feel good. And in this age of constant mental health issues, that's a real good push point. So there's a science behind it, if you want to look into it, really interesting. Um, unauthorised trail used one of our old forestry signs that we forgot to take out of the way and put it up to warn people that there was an official trail below it. Really good. At least they put some signage up, but it looks like it's official and it's from us. So, um, I met the, and this is all fairly recent, so I met these guys and kind of spoke to them from the local bike club, four of them built it, built about three kilometres of tra trail in about nine days, amazing, really good ground, but really quite well built. Um, we took the signs down, we're talking to them now about setting up a unit management agreement. There's a process we need to go through, they might need planning permissions, all sorts of other things they might need to do, it's just a process, they're not barriers, it's just a process they've got to go through. We might end up going, you know what guys, here doesn't work, but over here might work. Saying no all the time isn't an answer. You're just going to move the problem around. Um, another, we should start doing clear fall operations. Now, is that a built trail or is it a scratched in line, like Mike said? If enough people ride it and move some sticks out of the way, you've got a trail. It's that easy. Um, you go to the other extreme, can't quite see that, but there's a lot of built features there, big wooden platforms. Um, the one in the middle there is about that high. You have to jump onto it, there's no ramp onto it, and you have to jump off the other end. And all the land managers see stuff like that, the structures that are built and kind of, oh my god, people are going to die. There's only about 20 people can ride that. So your real risk is actually quite minimal. They know what they're doing. Your average five-year-old, ten-year-old on a bike isn't going to go and ride off that. The stuff that's really dangerous is your little jumps that the kids build in the woods, or the small feet, because everybody who rides a bike in the room will go, oh, I'll go at that. So the chance of them crashing is much more, the potential is much higher. Obviously, the, 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 the consequence of having a crash on that is more severe. You might get that life-changing injury that leads to a legal case. 
but the chance of it happening is actually quite small. So sometimes the bigger stuff that might scare you as a land manager actually isn't your problem. The smaller stuff is where all your accidents are going to happen, and that's where we're just playing a numbers game. If there's enough accidents, eventually one of them will turn into a claim. Built jumps are the common ones we used to see. So five or six years ago, most of the unofficial trails contained drop-offs and jumps. Now, because the sport's moved on and we're looking at those enduro lines, we're, we're seeing steeper, more twisty kind of lines down hills, but with less constructed features. These things still appear, but there's less of them. There, you know, that 150 kilometres of trails we map, there's only about four jump sites in that 150 kilometres of trail. So most of them are just desire line stuff, contour lines, stuff that works for steeper descents that are just really technical. Um, this is a, a site we call Coid Parkio. Um, if you're a rider, it's called Tipentris in South Wales. Um, massive site in a, in a way leave. And because we haven't sent any staff out there for quite a long time, they virtually built a bike park by hand. Huge amount of work. Really amazing site to ride. <laughs> there's a whole lot of jumps down the bottom here and there's some drop-offs in there. And, and we're in a process now, we're looking at that and kind of, it's got to a stage where if we had to rub that out, we'd need two walking excavators, the, the public backlash should be huge, and we just move it somewhere else. So there's a concept now about working with them, local authorities talking about providing some investment to make that work. So the public road at the bottom and the public road at the top, so you can uplift it. There's issues, it's going to need planning permission, there's other things going on, but that's the sort of thing that you can end up with when you get lots of people. And this was the guy who built this started building it because we closed down the downhill trails in Kumkan because we were doing forest operations and he had nowhere to ride. So he started building his own little lines and then his mates help him and then some more mates help him and then some more mates help him. And before you know it, you've got a bike park that you didn't know about that's unauthorised, that doesn't have planning permission. So you can see the scale of stuff that, that goes on. And that's the same throughout the UK. Depending on how many people you've got living locally will be the scale of your problem, but it will be there. That's a, the stats for that site, so the, the bald trails, you'll see they're the ones actually on that site and normally you'll find the group of building these trails here, there'll be some people in the neighbouring land that are building trails over there as well. So you end up with these loops around that come on our land, off our land, on our land, off our land. And using them there, quite staggering, that bike park, 887, uh, 8,875 riders have used that site, it's crazy. There's, there's videos on it, just type into Pentrus into Google, amazing video. All, all done without any permission whatsoever. But a site we've got to deal with, obviously. Uh, big part of the thing in South Wales is the club network. So we have five or six clubs that, that range from 300 to 700 members. Again, it's, it's that population base. So these guys here, there's a guy in the centre picture there. Pete, it's his fault. Um, this is the Aberdare Mountain Bike Club. Um, him and three friends, who are all businessmen, they own businesses. He, he sells um, drugs to help people. Um, they bought 900 blue shirts and they sold them all. And they have this massive club that has lawyers, it has doctors, it has bigger drivers, it has chainsaw operators. Their resource is massive. When we all talk in the public sector, we haven't got the resource. There's your resource. You might not have 900 of them, you might have 20 or 30, but there's a whole great, there'll be marketeers, there'll be lawyers, there'll be all sorts of people that can help you make that stuff work. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see that almost football mentality amongst all the clubs. They've all got different coloured shirts. They all go out. Um, what we tend to get is inter-club rides, totally unofficial, no permission. 200 people turn up in a car park, all the clubs get together, and they go off for a ride. A massive issue from a land management point of view, but it's kind of cool from a society point of view. We're getting loads of people together and going out in the outdoors. We need to put some structure in there, and we're trying to try and make it official. But the concept's great, isn't it? We're getting people out into the outdoors and doing stuff. Fantastic. Obviously, very social media friendly, other apps are available, um, but obviously Insta, Facebook, Strava, all that stuff you can get data from. Big one, some people might not know about, Trail Forks. We used it yesterday to go around, we, we rode around with Australia yesterday, and every time we came to the intersection of the downhill trail, and his Garmin told him what trail was coming in from there and going out there. Um, if you're a land manager and you've got stuff on, on Trail Forks, if you email them and say we're responsible for that land, you can take down stuff that's on that land. So you can redo it in our areas. So they email us and say, these riders have sent this, this route, can we put it up or not? And if it's in a contentious area, then we don't plan to do it. That's my email, I'll be around all day, give me a call if I think Dave's gonna come over and look at the process we've developed now for how we manage all that. Uh, Wales has got about uh, close on 600 kilometers of uh, formal managed mountain bike trail uh, in the mid 
Uh, we've been doing that since the mid-1990s. Uh, in the early 2000s, when the Welsh Assembly was being formed, uh, they weren't all that good as a government at spending money. And uh, we got to the end of a financial year and they're saying, we've got about three and a half thousand uh, million pounds left. Uh, what can you do with it, Forestry Commission? And so, uh, enterprising that we are, we said, well, actually, we've got this guy, uh, Davis, who's building mountain bike trails. We could probably spend it on that. Uh, and, and so, <coughs> literally, that kind of cash uh, spend at the end of a financial year was where we built our first five mountain bike centres. Uh, and I know you've all been over riding them. Uh, we built the, what used to be the Marin Trail near Bethsacoid. We expanded the trails in Coida Brennan. Uh, we did stuff at Nantararian near Aberystwyth. And then the, Bob, the centres that Bob's talked about uh, in, in Avon Valley uh, and in Kunkarn. They were our first five centres. And it was all about attracting those big guys uh, with the big uh, posh bikes on the back of their posh cars and trying to get them to empty their wallets into the rural economy in Wales. And that's where we started. Uh, and we developed that product very successfully. It worked for us as forest managers because at that time, uh, mountain biking was taking off and it was a great way of uh, guiding and directing the people. And it meant we knew where they would be. It enabled us uh, as forest managers to uh, direct where we wanted those riders to go. Uh, it wasn't about uh, informal trails, wild trails, natural, uh, unauthorised. Uh, it was about trying to get them to go uh, where we wanted them uh, and, and to uh, extract the pound. And Bob's presentation, you can see uh, particularly, you know, Bob really is in the crucible of uh, informal trails uh, development and management. Uh, over the 10 years I've been in post, it's become increasingly difficult and, and, and we've, we've recognised latterly that it, it, it's simply become uh, too much. Uh, Bob's giving you some figures about his patch in South Wales. Uh, I've been working with a contractor to try and get uh, North Wales mapped uh, and had a couple of lengthy meetings with him and at the end of all that uh, time he said, actually Dave, you know what? I'm going to fall out with too many of my mates if I try and do this work for you. And I'm thinking, you're turning down thousands of pounds worth of work? Yes, because I'm going to fall out with all of my mates uh, if I tell you where all of their secret trails are. I'll find another contractor. I'll do it anyway. Uh, because it's really important that we're able to justify our actions as land managers and what we're going to do. Uh, so it's very it'll be useful to have uh, you know, how many kilometres, how many riders, how often... Uh, whereabouts and, and to put it on a map to try and justify our actions. <coughs> my most recent, uh, one of my mo most recent pieces of work then uh, is better wild trail uh, guidance uh, for our staff. Uh, and as a precursor to that, we, we, uh, we've developed a series of position statements, uh, a lot of activities on our and, and NRW uh, manage the Welsh Assembly, the Welsh Government's woodland estate. We manage it on their behalf. Uh, and a lot of activities that do take place uh, need permission. And so we figured we'd better have a series of uh, position statements about how we were going to approach different activities on our land. So you can imagine uh, things like vehicle access, uh, cycling, walking, running, orienteering, how we're going to uh, manage those activities across the piece. And so if you've got a, a cycling activity going on in your land, uh, we thought it was important that those people who were coming in there understood what was acceptable and allowable. Uh, so you can imagine, this is cut and pasted from the activity statement, a uh, position statement three about cycling. So a little bit about who's coming, uh, where they're going to go, what they're going to do. Those are the groups. Uh, we're trying to educate people. Where can you go uh, without needing our permission so they know what they can do? Yeah? When you'll need permission from us. So we're trying to make it clear about what they can do and what they can't do. You can imagine this features uh, 
slightly less than prominently on the uh, NRW website, so it's available to the public. We're telling them what uh, is permissive, uh, uh, what they're allowed to do, what they're not. Uh, you know, this has only been uh, up for uh, just over 12 months. <coughs> if you'd like to build anything on our land, you'll always need our permission. Uh, and so, you know, less than 12 months after this has gone up, I think we're going to just going to have to change this. It's just, our position just isn't tenable. You know, there's only one Bob in the South. Uh, Andy has a slightly easier time in the North. Uh, but it, it, it's just not tenable. Uh, and so, my most recent, and I'm moving away from that wild trail terminology, that unauthorised trail terminology, because I don't want that user group uh, to feel that they're uh, the outlaws, you know, the badass guys. It's a bit pointless, and if anybody else were to uh, look at this guidance, uh, there, there, there's that uh, illegal, unauthorised uh, badness tag to it. So I'm trying to move uh, to that informal mountain bike trails uh, label for it, to try and legitimise it, because the right thing in the right place is what we're after. This is the nub of that informal trail guidance document, and it's, you know, because this really is a fresh approach for our, our organisation, we've been very public sector, we've been very paternal, uh, and, and it's command and control, you will do as I, uh, do as I say. Uh, and it's not officially signed off yet, and we, there might be some weasel word changes in, in bold at the bottom. Uh, but we're having to accept as land managers, land managers there's going to be a general presumption uh, that unauthorised mountain bike trails can stay unless there are site-specific circumstances that say they have to go. So that's a flip, a big flip from our organisation work. Uh, you know, go out, discover it, find it, tear it to pieces as quick as you can. We've got to stop it at all costs. And of course, poor Bob, and he stayed with Red Hot, he hadn't got time to do all that. It just simply wasn't going to work. And so, a big flip, uh, they can stay unless there are site-specific circumstances uh, that mean it's got to go. I've got to throw this caveat in, and this is really important on an individual basis. Uh, Bob's already talked about, you know, he knows those guys at Aberdeen and Mountain Bike Club. There's an army of them. They might kick the shit out of him <laughs> if he starts digging up their trails. Uh, his lovely wife uh, is, is, is part of a community group that's looking to adopt some trails uh, in, in a separate woodland. And so, as land managers, as organisations, you have to think about the management of your staff and allow them a get-out clause uh, in, in your <coughs> approach. Uh, to building relationships with those clubs, uh, it's a conflict of interest. And if we uh, if we expect to keep Bob on the books, and he is looking at a job in uh, developing that bike in Scotland, uh, we've got to keep looking after him. And, and so I threw that in for that reason. You know, it is a small community, and it's people's passion. They care deeply about this, and and, and temperatures get raised, uh, and so it's really important that we look after our staff. Wherever we go, wherever we find them, my first instruction as a part of this informal trail guidance, put up a warning sign, a uh, kennel like this. What I don't want is a nasty surprise. Uh, and so as people are walking into any woodland, we're going to be uh, erecting these, and that's to stop that uh, nasty surprise. So people will know somewhere in this woodland, you know, I might be a walker, I might be a horse rider, there might be, you know, there's going to be an informal mountain bike trail. Uh, I'm almost certainly going to change the wording and get that unauthorised out of there and call it informal. Uh, but this is something that Bob is using. So the first thing we're going to do whenever we find it is always put up a sign and let everybody know. Get, out, get rid of that uh, nasty surprise. Uh, some of the terminology is a bit old fashioned in there uh, and we might be sexing that up a bit. Our land management staff, uh, I'm going to be expecting them to do a risk assessment. And this is building up the justification for why that trail can stay or why it has to go. Yeah? Uh, 
is the third party access? What's the church construction standards like? Uh, does it impact, and this is the big important thing, does it impact on other users who are there of legal right? Is there a public footpath? Uh, they'll almost certainly, if it's part of our freeholder state, uh, there will be people exercising their rights under Crow, Countryside and Rights of Way uh, 2000. And so there are other user groups in there of legal rights. Now, if that informal trail is, is some big old gap jump that might take the head off of somebody quite innocently walking their dog, then this kind of risk assessment process, we're going to need a record of that. Uh, and that will be our justification if we think there's... Uh, that's why we need the metrics, so we know how many riders are doing that gap jump. Uh, we'll be able to look at the public footpath and see how many people are using that. And it's, that's the kind of uh, judgment call that we'll be expecting our land managers to take. You know, what's the risk to those other users? Great big gap jump, gnarly landing, not a problem. Riders, knock yourself out. If you're going to impact on other people who are using that woodland legitimately of right, then that's a problem to me as a land manager. And those are the sorts of circumstances uh, where we're going to have to start uh, modifying or potentially removing trails. You know, a lot of land <coughs> uh, in Bob's Patch, South Wales, is only leasehold, and it might be a forestry only lease, and so we're breaching the terms of that lease, letting people in in the first place. And so uh, there will be circumstances where uh, Informal trails are just not appropriate. So we end up with our three different approaches. Uh, I've just been talking about, there are going to be some circumstances, and riders are going to have to accept it, where, I'm sorry, this is just never going to work here. I was responsible for one of those in North Wales. There was a long distance footpath across the top. There was a bridleway through the middle. Uh, there was a bridleway across the bottom, very popular in an AOMB. And that downhill trail, the nature of it, crossing those legal rights away, was never going to work. I'm sorry, it was just never going to work. And I, 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 I talked about bridges, I looked at tunnels, I tried really hard. It was just never going to work. It had to go, sent in a digger, dug it up. Uh, but at the same time, provided an alternative venue with no public rights of way. And it's called Voyal Gaznak. Uh, and, you know, uh, Voyal DH Riders is the Facebook page. And that, now that works very successfully. They've got uplift, uh, the right thing in the right place. Uh, tinker with it, stroke them, you know, because sometimes you just have to re-educate the riders. You have to get them to modify their trails, particularly the crossing points that somebody was talking about earlier. Uh, modify trails will only be acceptable if modifications are made. Uh, things must change in this scenario. That would be the trail itself, that would be the riders. Uh, what we want is win-win outcomes. You know, if, if, if the Welsh Assembly were looking for a, uh, a, a way of getting more people more active in the countryside, informal trails, we're getting it for free, guys. Uh, let's try and work towards more win-win scenarios. Uh, and what we want as land managers is the easy direction. Let them get on with it. If the only people who are going to be hurt and injured is the riders themselves, then, you know, the legal principle is valenti non fit and jury, you know. Uh, if people are knowingly going into a hostile environment to do dangerous things, it's their fault, guys. And we have to be more comfortable with that as land managers. So, we've ended up with a range of outcomes uh, across Wales, and that's a historical position. Uh, things like Bike Park Wales, formal commercial lease, uh, incredibly dangerous. They have a, an accident uh, at least every day. Uh, they've just taken on their own uh, paramedic. And fortunately, you know, we've kind of licensed that out. Somebody else now carries that risk. Uh, Dovey Mountain Biking they, is a community group that funded a, a formal trail. There's a massive amount of, uh, if you look at Dovey Forest, uh, there's a massive amount of informal trail in there now. And then looking at a way they've just submitted an application to uh, uh, allow them to inspect and do some uh, outline uh, maintenance on, on trails in Dovey Forest so we can get more people into Dovey Forest to, to manage, uh, to ride uh, that informal trail network. So that's building on what's already there. We're getting it for free. It's a win-win scenario. Uh, Avoil Gaznak, uh, you know, they do uh, on a club basis, they do uplift there. 
no public rights away, no, um, you know, it, it's a, a really poor quality uh, Douglas fir crop, not having any effect on the forestry, let them knock themselves out, that's great. Uh, we've got places like uh, Coy Park yeah, that Bob talked about, uh, the Junts, uh, we're at Macken, uh, uh, Parker Bulk near Bethesda in North Wales, uh, we're just letting people get on with it. Uh, and then I've talked about some women, the Scouts track, uh, it, it just was never going to work. So the right thing in the right place is currently uh, what NRW are going to do as a result of my informal, work, informal trails management guidance. We'll get to that. Yeah, thank you.